Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. This month, we are joined by Queen's Poet Laureate, Maria Lasella, and Professoressa Margherita teaches us Italian summertime words. Native New Yorker Maria Lasella is a journalist specializing in travel. She is also a poet. Her latest poetry collection is entitled Thieves in the Family. She has produced two chapbooks, Amore on Hope Street and Two Naked Feet. Maria co-curates the Italian American Writers Association readings in New York City. She is vice president of the Vito Marcantonio Forum and has recently been named Queen's Poet Laureate. Welcome to Italics, Maria. Thank you for inviting me. Let's start with a little history. Okay. What is the Poet Laureate of Queens? Who was there before? Queen's Poet Laureate um, position started under Claire Schulman. Each borough president of Queens has continued to do this process. It's a three-year term. Um, they've had six Poet Laureates. Um, the first one was Stephen Stepanchev, who just turned 100 mm. and published his 12th book of poetry. And he was also one of my professors at Queens College, oh. so it feels like a big circle. The second one was Hal Sirowitz, who I think has been published in 22 languages or something. And he's part of my online circle called Brevitas. We write short poems twice a month and circulate them and then have a festival with Bob Holman at Bowery Poetry Club. And the third one was a woman named Isli Park, who is a Korean uh, poet. Then there was Julio Marzan, mm -hmm. and Paolo Javier was the last one, and he's Filipino. And I actually did try for this six years ago, and I didn't get it, so I was a finalist. And I just thought, let me try again, why not? And um, so it was kind of important to me, in a way. I think partly because in poetry there's not a whole lot of remuneration, let's say. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're kind of interested in yeah. getting yourself published in certain places and reading in certain places and getting to know certain people. And so that becomes your, <laughs> you know, your little measures yeah. of success. I mean, I think we can say um, that poetry is sort of the Cinderella of literature in oh, the public yeah. sphere, right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, I have my own take on it. I think basically because it's hard to read. <laughs> In, in yeah. the sense that it challenges the reader much more right. than prose right. on a normal basis, right? So, and without getting into the so-called language poets, right. and, you know, the, the her, 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 hermetics and things of that sort. So, but let's let's now we know what the poet laureate is, and so right. it's a great honor. It's wonderful. It's and, wonderful, and, because and you're the first Italian American, first Italian American, second woman, yeah. and it's um, it's a competition. So it's not an appointment. And the committee, the selection committee is pretty large. It's like 12 people. Right, right. From the Queen's libraries, yeah. from the universities. Uh, there was a poet. There were two poets, actually. So, yeah, it was kind it's of a rigorous little exercise. So you're feeling good. I'm feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, talk, fun. let's talk about your poetry. How long have you been writing poetry? Um, you know, I think the first, I was thinking about this this morning. The first poem I got published was, um, I was in high school. It was a haiku. And uh, I had just discovered haiku. And, but I think of my fascination for language mm -hmm. has always been there. And I think that, that poetry, actually, even though people m read more prose, I think poetry is a more natural expression because it's based on breath and talking and sound. And I grew up in a household of people speaking calabres, English, a little Italian. Okay, so there's all these sounds. And I remember, you know, standing in our living room in South Jamaica, saying to my mother, I can figure out the homonyms between the Italian one and the English one and the Calabrese one. My mother thought I was crazy. But, you know, between phonetics, which we were taught, yeah. phonics, right. um, which we're not taught anymore, um, language became kind of a, a puzzle and, and a game. So I think the poetry sort of came out of that. And, you know, when I was a teenager, I wrote poetry, just like everybody says, oh, I wrote poetry when I was a teenager. Um, and then I stopped. Okay, so what happened there? You know, was there a point of passion that disappeared? Oh, you know, I was in love, I fell apart, I got depressed. And of course, adolescence is this rich, rich, crazy period of your life that yeah. you feel the extremes. And poetry becomes, for some people, a way to express that, and, and a way to figure it out, and a way to get out of it and survive it. So 
that was the period of things like love is never having to say you're sorry, love story, mm -hmm. Rod McEwen, mm -hmm. you know. And these are very accessible forms of poetry. His was very accessible. I mean, once he became successful, it seemed that people thought his poetry was hallmark. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, actually. Um, but he gave access to people. And I thought that was an interesting period, because the folk music was like that. Joni Mitchell, Judy Collins, Bob Dylan. These were, this Simon is poetry. And also. Simon and Garfunkel, right. Queens. Um, this was poetry. And it was being sung, and it was being uh, sung together, and it was being sung collectively. So there was a lot of poetry in the air. So for someone in my generation to not come out writing poetry, if you're a writer, it's kind of odd almost. You yeah. Know? So yeah, and the, the poets you mentioned uh, are the ones who in the last 15 or 20 years have also been the subject of study. Actually, their yeah. lyrics have been the subject right. of study, right, right, as you just said. Yeah. Have you been reading poetry, uh, you know, since junior high school to high school? On yeah. and off. You know, I'm, mm. I'm, I have to say that in terms of, like, things that influence me, I mean, I read everything. I read the size of you know, cereal boxes. I read this. I read everything, mm -hmm. and I think all those crazy things feed into you know because you have you have your periods when you can't think about what to write, and so you have found poetry. But the idea is that you're looking for it, mm -hmm. and you're you're primed for it, whether it's on the subway or it's a dialogue. And there's a lot less dialogue on the subway now, mm -hmm. actually, because people people in their are texting text instead of talking. <laughs> 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 so you know, I'm missing this exactly. piece of like you know some inspiration. Yeah. So. You know, but interactions. And of course, you know, if you come from an Italian family or any family that you listen closely to, they never disappoint. There's always something. There's always something. How about some formal influences in the sense of poets? Who are some of the poets that you sort of go back to? There are certain voices that certainly resonate yeah. with me. Um, when I was in college, I took um, one of the early black literature classes at Queensboro. And that was fascinating to me because it was the voice of the outsider. And it was something that I hadn't really identified with as being an outsider, but I kind of was. I was kind of on the margins. Um, and I wasn't totally American. I wasn't really Italian. But I had this sort of otherness. And that poetry really spoke to me, when it was from Langston Hughes or Lucille Clifton mm -hmm. or Nikki Giovanni. Um, all of those people kind of spoke to me. And then I was also in a dance company at the time, an American dance company. And um, that, that had something to do mm. with that, too. Um, but the people I go back to are people, some of my contemporaries, Maria Fama, mm. Maria Maziotti Gillen. Um, I study with Alicia O. Stryker, who um, really blends politics with personal. So there are feminist poets. Um, and on occasion, my husband is somewhat of an inspiration because he's a poet. Right. And his work is mainly narrative. But it's, it's interesting to watch his process, which is totally different than mine. So um, I don't know. I mean, I've read John Charty. I've read Dana Joya. I've read more formal poets. Um, I mean, I like uh, some 17th century poets. But um, I mean, I don't just read them all the time. But I'll, I'll go back to Blake. Um, I'll go back to Whitman. Um, so yeah, there's a few that I mm. revisit. You, you mentioned a few names that lead to my next question, and that is, um, you, how does class, gender, ethnicity enter into your poetry? I mean, I know it does. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and the three poets you mentioned, of course. Yeah, they all address that very class, much. Class, gender, so. and ethnicity. <laughs> yeah, class, gender, ethnicity. Well, you know, the gender, of course, is gender <laughs> politics, and yeah. you know, I grew up in the feminist period and um, part of feminist movements, and I was part of a socialist feminist organization. So, um, but I found it hard to write about that directly. So, um, and I also felt that I was sort of a little bit insular as a person because, as a kid. I grew up with not a whole lot of friends because I had cousins. I didn't really have to socialize beyond my circle, mm -hmm. my very safe circle. And I learned something in the feminist movement, which was that not to be ashamed of where you came from and to understand that your private skills that you learned from your grandmother and your mother, namely negotiating, um, could be used publicly. Those skills are transferable. 
And that helped me learn how to write about that in poetry. Um, so that's sort of the gender part of it. But I think you can't really take it apart because for me, you know, ethnicity is it's just who I am. But it also helps me to sort of indulge that because, you know, by continuing to speak Italian, to visit Italy, to stay in touch with my cousins, because it's a grand continuity for me. Um, it always reminds me where things came from and where I'm going because I find if I can understand where I'm coming from, I can understand a lot of other people and their immigration patterns and their, their willingness and sometimes their, sometimes their willingness to compromise mm -hmm. to become part of a, a larger space. And so it's interesting to me, and that's, that was part of why I kind of wanted to do the Queen's Poet Laureate um, position because Queen's is like the world. I mean, I think I've seen numbers between 130 and 170 language themes spoken in Queens. So it's a very multicultural place and it's and it's and it's you know imbued. It's thorough. represented She's at Queens College too. The Klan right. Institute is affiliated sure. with Queens College and, and I think the number is something like hundred and sixty countries are represented, something to that Amazing. effect. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I've visited sixty <coughs> countries because um, I've been a travel writer. Right, exactly. But oddly enough, this is such a there was such a job and it was like a, you know a fabulous place to be, but a fabulous place to be exposed, especially for a person like me who was so rooted. I mean, I love home, but I really love to travel and, and you know sort of dither around in other people's cultures mm. and learn things, whether it's food or whatever they do. So um, it's been really a great journey. So you co-curate. The, uh, the Iowa, the Italian American Writers right. Association, monthly readings. And you're also involved in the Vito Marcantonio Forum. So you're not the stereotypical poet who sits at home and just sort of looks into space and writes verse. Yeah, I don't <laughs> Which know. Which is the stereotype people. of the I don't it know is, that poet it either, is. but it seems that everyone has that idea that, you know, the po or, or the male poet is sort of sitting in a cafe smoking French cigarettes with a beret on his head. And I like that. Right, too. Writing, <laughs> you know. I mean, I've you fallen know. for people like that. So <laughs> but, but I mean, you're active <laughs> also for others. You're in the sense yeah. of co, because we know what it means to organize readings yeah. and things of that sort. And right. sometimes people forget to give the salute at the end. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, as I tell people, you know, if you want an audience, you have to be an audience. Yeah. Just saying. Right. You know. Right, so which, is a, which, is a re, the, which is a re-articulation of Iowa's sort right. of mantra, right? We have, a, we have three rules in <laughs> yeah. Iowa, which is uh, read each other, um, write or be written, and buy our books. And buy our books is a little bit murky now because people buy them online or they buy them here. But the idea is to go after them, yeah. is to buy them. And um, Iowa's been through a very interesting period. It's, it'll be 25 years old next year. It's imperfect. Um, it's wonderful because it has given voice to so many people. Um, and I, what, one of the thrills about Iowa is watching people from 15 years ago, maybe you, they came in and they talked about their surprise party when they were seven and their nonnas and their, but you know, a lot of people who have stuck with it, because there's a, there's a real core, mm -hmm. um, they've developed, they're publishing books, they're getting published in you know, better journals. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not just self-publishing. I mean, some people are, but some people are going beyond that. We have, you know, we have publishing opportunities like Bordighera Press, which we didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, it was there, but it's bigger. I mean, it has a much bigger presence now. We have the Calandra Institute, mm -hmm. which is activist and free and cultural, so if you don't know something, you can step in and find out about it. Um, we have VIA, we have now it sounds like Italian Americana is going to continue. Around. So these are really important um, venues for publishing. And I don't know that they were so well known 20 years ago. Also, there's Guernica, which initially, I think, helped kick off a lot of the energy uh, maybe 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, 1990. Because, exactly. Yeah, because we didn't have that. No. We didn't have it going on here. And the Vito Marcantonio arm is kind of an expression of my, my progressive politics and my consciousness about community, which also feeds my 
my Iowa activities. Um, I know Italians are often seen as, you know, just taking care of home and, and being, you know, just concerned about self and family. And, but I didn't grow up with parents like that. My parents were very active. My father was in the CCCs, which was the Civil Conservation Corps. Uh, he had a sense of community because he left home early and didn't have a perfect family. Mm -hmm. um, he had a sense of community all the time. He volunteered until he died. My mother was also a volunteer, and my mother's 96 now. And, you know, the fruit of that is simply that at 96, for instance, her family's not visiting her every week. It's her volunteer friends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a sense of community that goes beyond her own family. Right. So that, that was important to me. And that's why Iowa is, became kind of, you know, an, an area that I felt I could contribute to and um, I could exchange with. And we've done a lot in the last six or seven years, actually. There's been a lot from the beginning, but that, a lot of that was more grassroots. And now I think, you know, we're developing a little more of a profile. 2006, we had a marathon reading um, for the 15 years. 2010, we did, um, I think we did a fundraiser. 2011 or 12, we did a big event at Casa Italiana with Jonathan Galassi, mm -hmm. Michael Palmer, Jane Tylus, uh, Rob Viscusi, who's the president of Iowa. Uh, Bonafini was there. Then, you know, the most recent thing, I guess, was at the Petrosino Lodge, which was the, Ita you know, the launch of Italian Americana. Mm -hmm. And that book has meant a great deal, and I think there's a lot that can be do done with it. But that provides such a big cornerstone for knowing more about yourself and your history mm -hmm. in America. That, that's tremendous. Even our cousins in Italy now have copies. Well, yeah. that, so yeah, that's and great. that, and that, that whole uh, uh, dialoguing of, of the, yeah, right, bridging that gap and crossing the ocean, both not just literally, but also sort of metaphorically. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, that's, that's, that's really developed. Mm -hmm. And that's also you, because Calandra has someone who speaks Italian, knows well, Italian, and looks for the bridges. Yeah. Well, yeah. This well, is my important. own formation is one of a professor of Italian. Uh, but this, formally. this is important for and Americans. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, some of us feel that you really need to um, be able to access the culture uh, to be able to really dialogue with it. And I think that if, if we, if, if the Italians, if the Italians stand there and we stand here and, you know, never the twain shall meet, right. well, then we're always going to have misperceptions of each other and we're not going to dialogue. Yeah. And I think some of, it's something that we've tried to do a little bit at the Calandra Institute is to, a lot. yeah, uh, is to bridge that gap. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. not and, it, and it's working. It's yeah, working because it's not abstract. You know, I just got back and I walked into a bookstore and I saw Le Muse, you know, a oh, translation nice. of Jonathan Galassi's right. novel. So it was great to see right there up front, you know, that there besides John Fante, of course John right. Fante is God right. in right. in Italy and in France and um, here I would suspect that many professors of American literature don't know who John Fante is. Absolutely. Which is yeah. so paradoxical. About Iowa, because mm -hmm. I, 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 I agree with you. I think Iowa has been um, extremely fundamental in creating a community, uh, a literary community, specifically right. poetry, although I understand that people can also come and read, they read their everything. prose, right, everything. or their or whatever, or their yeah. nonfiction and things Absolutely. of that sort. Yeah. Right. What are some of the sort of delightful discoveries, surprises, discoveries that... We had an interesting experience just yesterday morning, actually. The phone rang very early in the morning, and I almost wasn't going to pick it up. And I noticed it was someone who comes to Iowa regularly. I thought, 9 o'clock in the morning, I don't know. Well, as it turned out, it was his daughter, and which made me suspect it was probably, you know, mal in notizia, and it was. Um, this guy had passed away, and she said, I'm, I'm calling you because your, no your number is on the site, and you don't know how much this organization meant to him because, you know, he, was, he went through a lot of troubled times, and this gave him a community, and when my grandfather died two years ago, he contributed a lot of money to the organization, which he did. And she said he went almost every month, and he had, and he, and this guy brought a tribe. You know, he <laughs> brought like 12 people, yeah. and he brought five people. He always turned people on to it. And that, to me, is a thrill, because yeah. people get it. 
And it's not because, it's not such a, you know, it's not always a cozy place because we're in two cafes now. Yeah. Okay, so we have Iowa East at Sidewalk Cafe and Iowa West at Cornelia Street. Um, we took a semi-bad situation and made it into like a positive because we basically got cut back to six times a year at Cornelia Street, where we had been reading over 20 years mm. with the longest running series at that cafe. And someone helped find the Sidewalk Cafe. So we decided to call it Iowa, Iowa East and Iowa West as if we were expanding, but <laughs> um, so it can be a very tight, tightly run reading, especially Cornelia Street, because we do have to be out at a certain time. So it's not always people have a lot of time to exchange. But afterwards, they're doing that more and more. People are splitting off and having dinners together, and they're, they're not doing workshops together yet. But um, Gil actually um, started something, a, a cheer club. Gil Fajani, Gil Fajani, <laughs> who's also on the board, and co-curator, and my husband. Um, and he, he's a board to get a press uh, writer, actually. Um, so he, um, he started a Chircolo <coughs> online so that people can contribute. Um, there's not that many people who decided to do it, but it's only the first six months. Mm -hmm. And they go online and they criticize each other's work and they do, you know, quietly, one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one, and we'll see how it goes. So we're also trying to involve students, but we haven't figured out how best to do mm. that. But um, the thrilling part is watching people develop, you know, and emerge and have some successes. And when they stand up and say, I have this new book, people are like, you know, they're encouraged. Yeah. You know, and they're in this group. And there is some shorthand that you can use when you write sometimes, and they'll get it. And because the audience is so attentive and so responsive, People know right away if something works or doesn't work. Not because they're mean to you. They're never mean. I mean, this is a very well, you know, very well mannered group. <laughs> no one ever says, "Get that guy off the stage." You know, <laughs> um, they know better. Yeah. You know, we're <clears throat> this is a this is like an extension of family. Yeah. It's a way to make sense. But the volume of some of gets loud in the, the audience. Volume gets loud. <laughs> Sometimes it gets loud. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so we are working. We still have an anthology that we haven't published yet, which we called Big Mouths. Okay. We'll have to talk so we'll about that. that. As you well know, we did a couple of poetry fests at the Calandra yes. Institute for the month of April because April is uh, poetry month. National Poetry Month. So we'll have to talk about doing something as uh, with your with your poet laureate hat on, even though it'll be in Manhattan, it will. It still got the Queens. It's a center. It, it's, it's, it's still Queens got College. the Queens. It's Queens College. Clander Institute is Queens College. What are some of your ideas? I, I'm, this just happened, so right. I'm sure you've got a hundred ideas going into your head. What you would like to do? What you don't? But anything so taking form yet? Or um, well, um, the previous poet laureate did this fabulous event with Queens Museum, and I'm suggesting that we do that Biennale. Mm -hmm. as a biennale and as a continuity. Um, the other thing I had suggested, and I'm not sure how to implement this, um, I'm going to talk about it with the borough president's office. Um, I should mention that Melinda Katz is very, very committed to this position because culture is in her DNA. Her mother created, um, helped create the Queen's Council for the Arts and her father helped create um, the Queen's Symphony Orchestra. So uh, she's definitely in for the, in for the duration. Um, but I had also suggested possibly doing something online in various languages, where poets who maybe write in two different languages would read it, and it would appear in their language and in English. Oh. And they would read out loud so we could hear how it sounds, even though we don't know what it means. Because people tend to be much more animated if they speak in their own language. We've seen that on the stage. We've had bilingual readings. And when a Neapolitan reads a Neapolitan, he doesn't read the same way in English. <laughs> His body language is like yeah. this. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of that guy Dukakis, you know, who was <laughs> Greek. And it was like someone tied his hands tied his down hand, yeah. because he was Greek and said, don't speak with your hands, you know. But his body language is so bizarre because to me it seemed like somebody yeah. told him that. Um, so you see that when people speak in their own language, their first language, as opposed to the second. So um, that would be like a major thing to be able to do, well, I Well, we'll look forward to that. Yeah, second Saturdays is when Iowa.
readings take place, and it's Iowa.net. Thank you for joining us. Thanks Palace. so much. Summer is most definitely here. Planning a trip to Italy? Board that plain language ready. Here's Professoressa Margarita with some seasonal phrases. Mm. Che caldo. It's so hot. I am so happy I'm going in vacanza. On vacation. So, where should I go? Al mare or in montagna? Al mare, to the beach, or in montagna, to the mountains? Mm, I think I'll do both. Buona estate a tutti. Happy summer to you all. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Italics. Catch up on previous editions of Italics at cuny.tv slash show slash Italics and additional digital programming on our Italics YouTube channel, Italics TV. Tune in to our next episode, airing August 26th. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.